Welcome to the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology, a joint laboratory of Stanford University and the Slack National Accelerator Laboratory. Uh, it's wonderful you're all here. We've got overflow rooms. There's people uh, uh, lots of other places. Um, this Monday um, was Kai Pak's 11th birthday. It was St. Patrick's Day. There was Paris Hilton. I don't know what she did. She was in the news. <laughs> <coughs> None of this will uh, be remembered. Uh, the, the physicist circles, uh, what really uh, an earth-shattering <laughs> thing happened. Some of our colleagues went to Harvard um, to make a very big announcement. Uh, they had a lot of support. All the Stanford physicists were trying to stream it, <laughs> broke the Harvard servers. <coughs> so I, I hope for all the people that are streaming this uh, at the moment, I hope this is not happening to Stanford as well. Um, so we have a super tight-packed schedule um, of what I believe is just really a wonderful lineup of uh, speakers. Um, I will keep them uh, extremely to time um, because there's a reception at the end where we also want to have time to celebrate. So without uh, further ado, uh, let's give a really warm welcome to my wonderful colleague, Charlene Kuo. Okay, so you're probably applauding for that video. <laughs> that just went right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm, I'm going to talk about bicep uh, and B modes. Okay, same Harvard problem. All right, so the subtitle of this talk is what I think is an amazing combination of three big ideas inflation itself, how inflation generates gravitational waves, and how gravitational waves generate B modes. I think each one on its own is a monumental uh, landmark in human intelligence, if you will. And following these big ideas, there are amazing technology that enable this detection. Um, there's a printed circuit board type polarimeter on a the chip. There's a superconducting detectors, squids, um, but also Uh, focus, teamwork, faith, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that I'll touch upon a little bit. So this is a teamwork. Um, um, lots of institutes, four main ones are Harvard, Stanford, Caltech, and uh, Minnesota. Um, this is some of the people involved in this measurement. And since I'm with the home crowd here, I'm going to highlight <laughs> especially uh, the bicep and cat group at Stanford during the St. Patrick's Day celebration. So in particular, these three have been working on bicep 2 data for the past, and the experiment observation for the past five plus years, each and all of them. So the experiment is at the South Pole. It's the driest place on Earth. Um, why there? Because uh, microwave absorbs, uh, is absor absorbed by water vapor, uh, and water vapor also readmit uh, microwave. So you want to go to the driest place possible. And this is also the coldest place. All the water vapor in the atmosphere is frozen on the ground. There's wonderful logistical support there uh, by the NS NSF, uh, National Science Foundation. Um, and you can have just continuous observation. And I'll show a movie of that in just a minute. So we used to just copy this from Planck or WMAP website. Now we have a pretty good measurement. We create our own uh, history of universe. Um, cartoon, you know, in the future you can copy this one. So the scientific idea is very simple. So we use something, gravitational wave, that can travel across the entire history of the universe to study the very beginning, okay? So you can't quite use photons because photons last scattered uh, when the universe was uh, 400,000 years old. Uh, and that's not old enough when you're trying to study inflation. 
uh, because before that, the universe was compact, hot, dense, uh, and opaque to photons. So effectively, you have a curtain, okay? So you can learn tons of stuff from cosmic microwave background, but not the inflation itself. So the tool is, again, gravitational wave, uh, which can just travel you know, to the very beginning, revealing what's going on. Um, in this case, 10 to the minus 35 seconds uh, after the beginning. That's possible because gravitational wave, which is a stretching of space in different directions, uh, leaves a, a, a special imprint called beam polarization in the cosmic microwave background. Uh, and after that, because everything is transparent, you're just seeing an image of gravita gravitational wave imprinted on the microwave background polarization. So what is inflation? So inflation was invented in late 70s and early 80s to explain a series of uh, classical cosmological problems, um, like a horizon problem, which is essentially why was the universe so uniform. Um, and uh, flatness problem, and uh, some exotic uh, production problems. Uh, so the, flat, so infl the way inflation solved the flatness problem was just to make the universe much bigger than what we can see. So effectively making the uh, curvature measured by the size of the universe uh, tiny. And the way inflation solved the horizon problem is so remember, horizon problem is why the universe was so uniform to begin with, even though it didn't have time to um, get into a well-mixed state, is to re resort to uh, initial rapid expansion uh, of space itself, um, shown here. Okay, so this superluminal, super luminal, faster, faster than the speed of light motion. Uh, sets up the initial uniform condition of the universe. At least that was the initial uh, motivation for inflation in the late 70s and early 80s. And Andre will be talking about that. Hey. So inflation also does another wonderful thing, which is uh, creation of uh, two types of perturbations. One is called uh, the scalar perturbation, which is just an ordinary type of uh, density perturbation. And another is called a tensor perturbation, which is a gravitational wave, basically. So what happens is because of uncertainty principle, uh, even vacuum state had fluctuations, zero point fluctuations from quantum mechanics. For the scalar field that was responsible for inflation itself, called inflaton, it's a particle in a field. Um, the vacuum fluctuation of that inflated and amplified by the, by the, the inflation process generates the density perturbation studied very well by uh, many people here, um, also by CMB experiments like Planck, WMAP, SPT, so these are seeds of uh, structure formation. Okay, so vacuum fluctuation of gravitation or graviton um, is undergoing a similar process, okay? Inflation stretches that initial fluctuation, and it creates gravitational waves. So gravitational waves don't cluster unlike the scalar perturbation, so it doesn't form galaxies or anything like that. What it does, is it leaves an imprint um, in the microwave background. And uh, what we believe is this imprint has been detected for the first time by Bicep 2. So by this measurement, um, we confirm a whole other half of inflation. So this half is all of cosmology we know of until now. And we just, you know, we just found the other half, basically. All right? So this is just the beginning, we think. So in addition to confirming the inflation paradigm, um, it also sets the energy scale of inflaton because the amplitude of, uh, of this gravitational wave is proportional to the expansion rate during inflation. For physicists in the audience, so what's going on is um, it's just uh, classical equations of, uh, of gravity, uh, the Einstein equation, 
and you just linearize it, okay, and you set an inflating background, okay, and exponentially expanding background, and you form perturbation on top of it. You get a set of linear solutions that look like this. When a Fourier mode is well in, within the horizon, and the solution looks like a plane wave, except it's decaying, okay, Beyond the horizon size, okay, for a given Fourier mode, um, the amplitude is frozen. It's just as simple as that. It's just a linear solution to the perturbed Einstein equation. For scalar perturbation and for tensor perturbation, they look almost exactly the same. Um, for the scalar perturbation, it's just the scale, scalar perturbation, but for, for tensor, it's this amplitude times a unit tensor, if you will. So it's very simple. You're just describing the evolution of, uh, of tensor during inflation. Um, so basically, when you evaluate this function at horizon exit, you know the amplitude of, uh, of that perturbation. Um, and that turned out to be um, just the expansion rate. That's how, um, how the two are related. Okay, amplitude of gravitational wave and expansion rate. So these are linear solutions, because two classical linear equations. So what sets the magnitude? It was the quantum fluctuation in either inflaton field or graviton field that sets the um, RMS, the expectation value of that uh, linear solution. This amplitude could be zero or plus something, minus something, determined by Heisenberg's uncertainty, uncertainty principle for inflaton and graviton. Okay, so these are the uh, physicists who did these calculations uh, in early uh, 80s and, uh, late uh, and late 70s. So that's one. So we briefly explained inflation, we briefly explained um, how inflation creates both scalar perturbation and uh, tensor perturbation or gravitational wave, okay? Now, how does, inflation, how does gravitational wave generate B modes? So this was known, this picture was known uh, in early 80s. Since then, people thought there's no way to distinguish gravitational waves from density perturbation because both induce fluctuation in the microwave background in a very similar way, okay? And uh, for almost 20 years, or 15 years, uh, people thought that was the case. And then in 97, these two groups uh, came up with this brilliant idea of using uh, polarization of micro background. Um, everything is linear. You just measure uh, the linear polarization state as a function of space, uh, of location, and you do your vec vector calculus, separating the field into a, a gradient field and a curl field, or what we call an E mode and a B mode. And it turns out density perturbation can only generate uh, pure E mode, okay? Not statistically, but exactly. So it won't generate any B mode. Right. On the other hand, gravitational wave can generate both. So if you see B mode, you're seeing gravitational wave. To demonstrate that, I don't know if this works, so. We had a little Java demonstration created by three undergraduate students of Stanford. I don't know Java, so that, you know, I'll show you how professors work, you know, you just tell the students to do it. Can, can, can I get some help from Ken? <laughs> I also don't know how to work uh, Mac. All right, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to use uh, point sources to simulate unpolarized um, scalar perturbation uh, or density perturbation because you can use point sources to simulate any linear density perturbation. If you have one point source, the kind of linear polarization you get from a scattering screen of electrons, it's a proxy for uh, cosmic microwave background, you get something like this, right? So there's a characteristic uh, even parity uh, just from the symmetry of uh, Thomson scattering. 
which is just you know the incoming wave moving the electron back and forth. There's your E mode, right? The one that I just showed you. But this is also purely E. So whatever you do, you're not going to generate a curl. And you can add other point sources. You can change the amplitude. You can move things around. You can spend a whole night working on this, and you won't get a curl. <laughs> OK? So that's how powerful this uh, BMO theorem is. What about uh, gravitational wave? OK? What about gravitational waves? So there are two polarization states of gravitational waves, right? If you remember, it stretches space either this way or like that. Okay? These are the two polarization states called plus and um, cross. Yeah. OK, so you have this cross polarization, and the gravitational wave is propagating from that direction. You get E mode again. If you flip the polarization, that's your BMO, OK? And you know, if you see this, you know, it's coming from a gravitational wave polarized this way. There's no other way to generate it uh, to linear uh, level um, accuracy. So just to review, this gravitational wave started out as a gra graviton vacuum fluctuation. So it's a quantum gravity type thing. The energy scale of inflation is proportional to expansion rate, which is proportional to the gravitational wave power, um, not quite amplitude. Also, alternative models generate no gravitational wave. So this is seen also as an evidence for inflation. So there is this relation between field range uh, and UV complete completeness that Ava will talk more about. So I'll leave it out. So the pattern is very distinct, right? You look for curls. But unfortunately, the amplitude is very small still. So the difference between vertical and horizontal polarization, which is the Q-type polarization, if you rotate it by 45 degrees, it becomes the U-type polarization, uh, is only one part in 30 million, even for an unpolarized CMB4 uh, background. Uh, and on the ground, you have to see, see through the atmosphere that adds 15 Kelvin, the telescope emits another 15 Kelvin, so you add another zero there if you're observing it from the ground. Okay, so we get to the technology and the experiment part. How do you do it? And the focus part. Yes, I still have 10 minutes. Good. <laughs> so the Bicep Keck series is a extremely focused uh, experimental program. So we were trying to extract R and only R from all of this work. Okay, so that's the focus part. Okay, there's no astrophysics to be done, there's no cluster, lens, no, nothing, just R. All right, and um, these are all done with the simple refractive uh, experiment in a Dewar. Okay, so we just now move from 30 centimeter aperture to about 60 centimeter aperture, but still a refractor telescope in a Dewar with detectors operating at a uh, quarter Kelvin. Okay. So the first generation uh, of the focal plane um, was called BICEP-1. It was hand assembled by a grad student who is now in the audience. <laughs> okay, so it has uh, 48 uh, pixels, okay? And uh, it ran for three years from 2006, okay? But during, you know, while it was running, you know, we were already planning for the next step, okay? So really, this is not going very far with this technology. You can't hire 50 grad students to do this. Okay. So while BICEP-1 was taking data with the, you know, same deal, a cold refractive telescope, um, we were working on technology that would enable the next generation experiments. Okay? So the idea is very simple. You want to fabricate as many detectors as possible uh, and uh, without the hand assembly part and uh, with the same sensitivity, if not better. And you want to read out these detectors in an efficient way 
without involving thousands of wires going to the <coughs> cryogenic state. And this is um, manifestly a polarimeter, right? So you're seeing two polarization slots, and uh, the signal were summed coherently and sent to a thermometer, basically. A uh, signal in the vertical polarization goes one way, a horizontal polarization goes the other. <coughs> So it has this funny pattern. So first of all, it took us three years to get this design. Um, lots of different strange looking antennas were tried and failed. Um, so the idea is you want to maximize the bandwidth of, uh, of your antenna. So you need to lo have long slots. So this is the part that gets interesting. So the vertical slots have to be running into the horizontal slots like these. Okay. So the summing trees have to go through you know, all these and you know, kind of avoiding each other and, you know, without shorting and so on. OK? That was quite a challenge. So I just dig through my notebook and uh, realized this was finally done. Uh, this is uh, September 21st, 2006, while uh, Bicep One uh, was you know, observing um, in its first season. OK? So I was calculating the impedance and uh, the width of all the microstrip. Uh, it was tedious, it was hard, but I was thinking about inflation all this time. <laughs> <laughs> That's how, you, how you're motivated, all right? So once um, signal is summed uh, in the microstrip, it was sent to a thermometer, which is a thermally isolated lithograph island uh, with a dump, a power dump, basically. So this is a resistor. Uh, radiation is dumped onto the, the, the island, heating it up. Detected The thermal variation was detected in a superconducting detector called transition edge sensor that Kent will talk, tell you more about. Okay. All right. So nice pictures. All right. So once that um, was demonstrated, over the past eight years, more than 100 tiles of these things have been fabricated and deployed into BICEP 2, Keck, and Spider experiment, and soon more uh, in BICEP 3, with only little modifications. So that was a game changer. And uh, we got uh, three years head start, basically, because of that. All right, so not only are we focused, but also the telescope are very focused. So I was doing this. So this is Keck Array, which is a, cop, a five times copy of Bicep 2. That was a calibration. <laughs> <laughs> so Bicep, Bicep 1 did this for three years. Bicep 2 did this for three years. Keck has done this for three years into its fourth year. And Bicep 3 will do, be doing more of these. Very, very focused program. I'm trying to get R, R. <laughs> I'll skip this. So, so, by doing that, you measure the polarization as a function of uh, sky location, and you make a map, and you realize it's dominated by the E mode, okay? because you see these circular or radio patterns, mostly. Okay? So you go to, either go to Fourier mode or use different method. You get rid of all the E modes, and you're left with B mode. Once you've done that, you start to see something. But is it noise? Is it some leakage from incomplete subtraction of this? So for this, I have to highlight the work of one individual in the audience whose parents are here, I think. <laughs> yes. So without this guy, we wouldn't be celebrating. So the signal went from two and a half sigma to more than five sigma, sigma because, of, because of a nice uh, technique that Jamie developed over the past three years. Okay. So this picture has a lot more stories that I won't get into if you recognize some of them, but that's for some other time. All right, so that's after that's the separation. So zoom in. Uh, you see, you know, uh, it's those swirly pattern, and it doesn't look like um, it was artificially generated anywhere. 
uh, and then you compare it to a bunch of simulations without uh, a tensor input. And you realize, oh, there is a significant uh, curl or B mode uh, in bicep 2 data. So the scale here is 0.3 micro Kelvin. Again, that's uh, on top of the 30 Kelvin um, that we have to basically filter out. <clears throat> And you can calculate a scalar map out of that, but basically where you have a counterclockwise swirl, you have a negative B, and counter, uh, clockwise you get a positive B. And you form a power spectrum both by Fourier transforming that map, and you get this. So the black points were bicep two data points. Can I have two, two more minutes? You all want to know R anyway, so I can just say R is something, then my talk is over. But, <laughs> but so this plot shows you uh, data points from three experiments, bicep 2 auto, uh, that's bicep 2 map square, compared to sims, uh, bicep 2, bicep 1, cross, and bicep 2, cross, keck, which had uh, two very good years of observation. Um, so the, the auto, power spectrum is a little bit trickier because you have to know everything accurately, including your noise, uh, to debias the noise. But the cross is very, very robust. So it really ought to be zero if uh, two experiments have different systematics. Okay, so the fact that we pretty much saw the same thing in all these experiments meant uh, the signal is coming from the sky. Okay. So this is the lensing contribution, so that's the nonlinearity part. The linear part only generates a B mode. Uh, only gravitational wave can generate B mode uh, in the linear regime, but this is a nonlinear effect. Fortunately, the B mode we observed was way above the uh, lensing at the relevant <coughs> angular scale. Okay, and this amplitude is directly proportional to inflationary energy scale. So many people ask, have you really detected a uh, gravitational wave from inflation? So we really don't think, we know it's not systematics because we've done many, many consistency checks. Um, it's un highly unlikely um, it's foreground. But um, we are experimentalists. It's hard for us to say, yes, we've detected it. So I'll answer that with another question, what else? So this is the different systematics that we've done. <coughs> Um, different, you know, there's 14 different types of uh, jackknife tests um, split in terms of uh, observing angles, duration, channels, inner part of the focal plane, outer part of the, of the focal plane. Um, this is our best effort to estimate foregrounds. Almost done. Okay, and the points. So it's our best effort, you know, estimate shows the foreground really ought to be much smaller uh, than our signal. This is the bottom line plot with uh, previous experiments. Um, I'll skip that unless you have a question. So this could have been the only slide that I show, <laughs> but you know this already for almost two weeks now, I guess. <laughs> So, near-term future, um, we already have uh, more than 500, 500 100 gigahertz detectors um, observing at the South Pole. Just started, in fact, a few weeks ago. So, no, we don't have data to show you today. Um, but um, that's observing at a different frequency. The previous foreground separation was done with the uh, previous generation BICEP-1 experiment. Um, and BICEP-3, uh, which will add another 2,000 100 gigahertz detectors um, will be deployed in a few months. Um, it's still sitting in my lab, and this is your final chance to see it uh, in the next few months before it's shipped to the South Pole. Okay? So this is a short-term vision. So we really are well positioned to follow up this uh, discovery, and these folks will make sure it happens. All right? The BICEP3 group. So what's going to happen in the next few years? You know, so that 
red bar was my, you know, simple attempt to just draw an error bar on this famous um, tensor scale ratio versus uh, n sub s diagram. And the red region is roughly the current by sub 2 constraint. Where will it land once we reduce the error bar by a factor of 3, right? So, of course, the theorists will all be very excited one way or another. <laughs> so, now, one more slide, one more slide. So, now, there are more than 2 million people who can recognize my backpack. <laughs> which is right there. I need to get a new one. And Andre will tell a story about inflation. But Kim Minkowski said it's a grand slam for us. Let's just not forget another Slack guy who hit his grand slam with two outs, bottom of the ninth, with the three-run deficit here, Slack, 30 years ago. All right. So just a very quick announcement. If you're not tweeting, uh, turn off your cell phone, please, <laughs> so if the interference gets in the way. And for your questions, please wait until there's a microphone. So do we have some questions for Chao Lin? Let's see. This one right here. What took three years to analyze that, in retrospect, shouldn't have? Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, we're, we're being fair. Longer answer is we've been developing. So in the beginning, more than a little more than a year ago, when we first saw it, we, we said there's no way this is on the you know this our telescope is broken. But we couldn't find anything wrong with our data, so we split the data in two halves, and then we you know these folks came up with another method to split the data in two halves. We didn't see anything, um, and then you know 14 different splits. Later, we thought, oh, maybe this is on the sky. <laughs> yeah. Eva? Dumb question, but in your paper, you have a different likelihood depending on foreground models. Where yeah. You might have said 0.16 plus or minus whatever. I mean. Uh, so, so without all of that foreground subtraction, this is the bottom line. Um, even with all that foreground subtraction, uh, it moves a little, but not more than the uh, sample variance of this measurement. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think the bottom line message I want to give is um, zero is ruled out with very, very high significance, greater than five sigma, however you do it. Um, whether it's at 0.15 or 0.25, it's a little hard to say right now. Because we, we, we found no direct evidence that our data is contaminated with foreground. So I don't feel completely justified to just subtract it and report that single number. Okay, I'm actually uh, really glad if we're starting out slow with questions because we can save that for the discussions. Um, but let's thank Charlin again first. <laughs> um. and so. While we have Andre setting up, uh, yeah, it was really in 1979, evidently, where there's a sort of a fairly seasoned postdoc, I hear, uh, who was in the central lab uh, on the third floor, um, having a, a pretty awesome idea. Um, that's all over the news now, and we just saw the picture from Chao Lin. Um, and um, it's really sort of a paradigm, how to think about the universe, they're a very early universe, and a whole bunch of things of the first version didn't work so well, um, and that's where our next speaker, Andre Lindy, comes in. Uh, he fixed up uh, quite a, a few fatal flaws and made uh, some very special predictions along the way. And so um, let's also welcome Andre. It's a happy thing for him. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, I should start with the statement which was made by Mark Kamenkowski at uh, this uh, press conference, a data re release in Boston, he repeated the famous statement that extraordinary uh, discoveries require extraordinary proofs. 
so we still need to be absolutely sure in the result. On the other hand, I know uh, many people who came to this uh, well, technical discussion at press release as skeptics and left it uh, well, with firm uh, belief that this is uh, probably really true. So let's just see what will happen in the future, but right now let's see what it might mean for us. And actually I hope that what it means for us. So uh, that is inflation with biceps, because there are bicep one, bicep two, bicep three, whatever. <laughs> <coughs> now, and don't forget the skek arrow uh, with uh, five biceps. Um, so here is the basic result, you have seen it. That is something which uh, sound very convincing for me when, when I have seen this statement. You must be very, very uh, well emotionally sure in yourself by making the statement like that. This has been like looking for a needle in a haystack, but instead we found a crowbar. So yes, this is something which nobody expected because Planck data pushed everything down. So R was supposed to be very, very small, smaller than 0.1 with, well, uh, two sigma precision, so everybody start looking at something below, and then instead of that, they found something above. So that is the most interesting thing about it, and the thing which, of course, forced us all to be very careful about it, but nevertheless. So returning back to interpretation of different possibilities, this is a brief history of inflation in one slide. Everything starts with a paper by Starobinsky, which was based on uh, Einstein gravity Lagrangian pl plus quadratic terms. This was a very interesting, very complicated though model, and it has one problem. It described non-singular universe. So you could potentially uh, well go to minus infinity with it, but then simultaneously he knew that his solution is unstable. And these two things were in a contradiction with each other because it cannot exist at minus infinity if it decays in finite amount of time. So there was something strange about it, but nevertheless. Um, Alan Guth suggested old inflation, which, well, which was much nicer formulated than the paper by Stravinsky, especially because Stravinsky did not want to solve all problems of cosmology. Instead, he wanted to solve singularity problem, and he didn't. But uh, Guth tried to explain why the universe is large, uniform, homogeneous, isotropic, stuff like that. And that was something where he almost succeeded, except for in the end of the paper he had written that unfortunately we failed here and tried to convince others that the goal is so great that we better go in this direction. Then a year later he had written a paper saying that it's impossible to improve his scenario, but because mail from US to Russia at that time worked extremely badly, uh, I received it after I already improved it. And that was this <laughs> new uh, inflation scenario. New inflation scenario existed here, it existed for about one year after that, it died, and then I suggested something else, which is called chaotic inflation, then it was hybrid inflation, then many, many, many people started working on it because it was really interesting. So whatever we see right now is actually truly, it's not just, well, uh, truly, it was a result of collective efforts, efforts of thousands of people working in this direction. So uh, out of these models, after uh, you know, BICEP, this first is dead, and it was the most popular model a month ago. This was, well, died long ago. This one is dead. This one is dead. This one, it's various generation, uh, generalization of it, including especially Eva Silverstein uh, version in string theory. So far I alive, but we will see what happens. So I, I will just uh, show you. Now this is then the simplest theory where we have a quadratic potential of a scalar field phi, and you can study how this field evolves in this potential. And there are several different regimes in this very simple model. It's just parabolic. Uh, potential, a harmonic oscillator. So if the field is small, nothing happens, the universe remains small. If the field is large, then it moves down very, very slowly. And the reason why it moves down very slowly, because in the equation of motion for the scale of field, there's some specific term which looks like friction. So the field just sticks to the wall and moves down very slowly. If it is even higher, then it moves down very slowly, but quantum fluctuations may bring it even higher, and then you have eternal self-reduction of the universe. So the universe, you may start it with one milligram of matter, and then it starts 
while producing new and new babies with all of its possible uh, forms. So that was, uh, psych uh, well, philosophically, I would say, even uh, very interesting. These are the data of Planck, which everybody has seen lots and lots of time. And you see, this is how far they go, are well, hardly touching this area, which is of interest right now. On the other hand, this is what Spergel uh, published uh, three uh, months ago or something. They used different way of cleaning the maps by Planck, and they have found that maybe even point two is possible. I just received email uh, with some of the well, pe people who work in it that Planck is not very happy about this paper. They do not like whatever. So this is just this is science in uh, life science. So things are changing, but things are changing right now in amazingly interesting way. Now we started trying to understand how we can uh, uh, well obtain results predicted by Planck, and particularly this one. Look, this is uh, r equal to point zero zero four. Okay, we are now talking about point two, right? That's why I was stunned. Uh -huh. Okay, so point zero zero four, uh, and because it was in the center of the Planck data. And it also because it could be produced by r plus r squared, uh, Starobinsky model, but also plus lambda phi to the force, normal chaotic inflation model, which was ruled out already long ago. But if you add the minuscule term describing interaction of this field with gravity, then apparently everything becomes perfect. If this term, this coefficient here, is two thousands, you're already here. If it is 100, you're already here. If it is 0.1, it practically already coincides with Starobinsky model. So this was mystery. We tried to understand what it is, why it is so. This is Starobinsky model in a more detailed way. This r plus r squared, and it's possible to make some uh, transformations of variables, after which this theory, this was done in 84 by some person with the name Witt. Okay, so this potential start looking like that. And that is the st that, that's how it starts looking here. So instead of r plus r squared, you can write it in this uh, equivalent regime. Maybe Renato will tell you something today uh, saying that, well, this looks like r plus r squared. This is its equivalent. What if we change a little bit this potential here? Can we return back to something like r plus r squared plus maybe r to the n plus whatever? So to keep it only as a theory of the gravity, okay, without any scalar field. And the result uh, is, and that is something which uh, Renata and Sicotti, some Italian physicists, obtained pretty recently, that no, it doesn't work like that. So either it is this, or it is this with scalars. You cannot return to the theory of pure gravity, and that's maybe a very important conclusion, if this model goes out, okay? Now, uh, then we found that it's possible to generalize substantially all of these models uh, like lambda phi to the force. For example, instead of xi phi squared r, we can put here square root of potential and here any potential. And independently of the potential, after you do the proper transformations, hiding out this interaction, it's possible to do it just variable, change of variables. Then you always get a potential looking like St a Starobinsky model. So that's pretty interesting, but only in the limit of large xi. Now, if on the other hand, xi is zero, then it's obvious that this is just original theory, r plus whatever potential. So when you go from large xi to small xi, you make a very big way, and that's what we found. We found that you may start with the theory phi to the force, just what was known uh, uh, before, and you go here and you hit this Stravinsky. You start with phi cube and you hit poor Stravinsky. You go with phi squared and again hit the Stravinsky. So, and something interesting is going on. So you can read this in two different ways. You may say that this is an attractor point. Or you may say, actually, this is the whole family of different models. And we are going to watch what experimental data will be. And they can find something here or something here or something here. We have now a possibility to describe it all. Then we found a different set of models, and these models, just like the previous one, we made it not only in the scalar field theory, but in supergravity and superconformal theory. So it's possible to make, well, quite a big progress in just, well, making uh, uh, these models uh, in, a con in context of good theories. And this is what we found. 
different set of attractors. So they all go to this point, but no, it's already not a Starobinsky model. It goes up to r equals zero. So this is where this star should stay right now. But and then from r equals zero, they shoot again to these different uh, versions of chaotic inflation. So what does it mean when somebody says that, say, theory lambda phi to the force is ruled out by experimental data? You add the xi phi squared with xi equal to 100, you're already in the good area. Why don't you add it? Okay, so that's already becomes like you have some freedom. So the lesson so far, we have a large class of models with predictions which continuously uh, interpolate between different chaotic inflation models and the lowest part of the NSR plane uh, uh, by Planck satellite. Now we're returning by the biceps. Of course, this totally changed our, well, orientations. And this is, well, uh, I, I just gave a seminar at MIT suddenly when I was in Boston, and I mentioned to them that the famous story about why, uh, well, agriculture in Soviet Union was so unsuccessful, that was because every Congress of party was a turning point in the development of agriculture. <laughs> so here we had several turning points. First. Uh, it was Planck, which took us from the nice uh, phi squared type of models and brought it down here because this was, well, what, what can I do? And then now you have an absolutely turning point that brings us back to that, so it kind of, you may become hysterical. But what can, and, and especially if you need to give a, a talk within like a few days after doing it, and, and you are at that time at a tropical island. <coughs> So, um, the, the, res, uh, the result, r equals zero, that is the most important for me. r equals zero is ruled out at seven sigma. Well, then maybe if you read it differently and they take into account foregrounds, then r equals zero ruled out at 5.9 sigma. And for those who cares, this 5.9 is something like the probability of uh, zero is 10 to the minus eight, something like that. So for every normal person, that is quite okay. Okay, so, <laughs> <coughs> so what does it mean, assuming that this is right? So let's, well, just assume that it is right, because they have ample possibilities to check themselves, because as I was told, that they already going to read this uh, data from Keck, Arrow, whatever. Uh, 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 <laughs> yeah, anyway, so they're going to read new results soon. They're going to get more statistics soon. Other people will not let them live safely and nicely. So that, that will be certainly known soon what are the true results. But here is, um, here is a statement. There was this smoking gun for inflation. And that's not that I needed this smoking gun because all the known uh, well, versions of alternative versions of, um, for inflation, like periodic cycle, from my perspective, when I was reading it, they were full of so many just mistakes, not like interpretation, philosophy, just direct mistakes. That it was very difficult to really trust what is going on. But one thing, trust, unlike, who knows, maybe somebody else writes something smart. There was a paper in particular by Rubakov, followed by Criminelli, Huri, about something else, conformal mechanism. So it's nice to know whether there is a possibility to check all of these alternatives, and most of them required collapsing and then expanding, and of course it was very difficult by itself, but it has some property which all of them stated by themselves, that if you find gravitational waves, definitely rule out cyclic. If you find uh, well, gravitational waves, definitely rule out this other mechanism. So that's what we seem to have right now. Let's just be careful about it, but nevertheless that's what we have. What if R is equal to point 0.1 to point 0.2? then we have not only the gun, but the bullets too. And then <coughs> we may hit many popular inflationary models. And here are some results. So Starobinsky model probably is gone. I mean, if results are right, they are gone because it pre pre you know, predicts you 0 0.004, which is with the accuracy of bicep, this is equal to zero, okay? Uh, uh, so this means that probability of this is about 5.9 sigma small, 10 to the minus eight. The same is about new inflation, sorry, me. Uh, the same is hybrid inflation. 
The same is for most of the existing uh, versions of Higgs inflation, though one of them was recently modified in the way which essentially start looking like chaotic inflation. So it's possible to do something. This is string inflation. This is a table taken from this review, recent review. Look at that. 10 minus 5, 10 minus 6, 10 minus 7, 10 minus 10, 10 minus 5, 10 minus whatever. Eva <laughs> say that this, <laughs> yeah. This is, this is Eva's model, so I hope that she will tell you about it right now, and she actually say that it's possible to go even higher. So others are ruled out. There is something else to it. If you actually do something in string theory, then there is a mechanism among many. Eva studied the mechanism like that. We studied the mechanism like that. And it is possible to stabilize vacuum of string theory in a very tricky way. Once you stabilize it, you must check what happens when you have inflation, because inflation uplifts the minimum. And when it uplifts, it changes the shape of the potential. And the potential may be destabilized, and we will be in ten-dimensional space where we obviously are not. OK? So then the constraint for this will be Hubble constant, must be smaller than mass of the gravitina. And we all know that the popular gravitino masses discussed in the literature was about 1 TV. Now you may go to 100 TV, perhaps. Well, so saying that inflation is possible only at 1 TV, this would be terrible because then uh, uh, R would be 10 to the minus 24. OK? So now we need to do something else. And uh, this is the results. If R is equal to 0.2, then gravitino mass is 10 to the 14. In this sense, you, it makes LHC phenomenology a very hard thing to do. Well, <laughs> I mean, it's like 10 orders of magnitude above. Um, then Renata and I invented a mechanism of stabilization, which would allow it, potentially. It is possible to have small gravitino and still stable vacuum. What it says, however, that uh, cosmology allows us to test string theory seriously, because if we know that R is large, then we know that something must be done with the models which we study right now, and many of them are ruled out. So this is just in response to those who say that string theory is like a philosophy, it's untestable. No, actually it is not. So uh, this is like a la last thing that I'm going to say. So bicep results, if confirmed, ruled out many inflationary models, single out some of the best models, and then uh, allows you to uh, well, uh, work on some other developments. So tentative conclusion about this, and tentative conclusion would be, well, just <laughs> like, like, <laughs> like that. And of course, I must say that uh, it's easy for me to tell this, but who I am to tell it? I, I just returned from this tropical island. What do I know? And this is, trust it or not, this is me chasing this uh, turtle. And here is Renat <laughs> following the lead. So that's as much as I know about bicep. Um, and thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Great. All right, time for a few questions. Oh, we have a. Okay, Stefan, yeah. Do you think there's a tension between Planck data and bicep data, or did I misunderstand this? Because you said that... What, once again? So, are you saying that there is a tension between the data from Planck oh, yeah. and but, the but data from bicep? But he has shown it to you. On, on one of his slides, uh, uh, Chaolin has shown you that this is their data, and this is Planck, and Planck does not allow you to go higher. So, that's really a tension. And uh, all of this was discussed there at this meeting, and Chaolin can tell you much more than I can about that. So essentially, uh, the statement is that, well, maybe Planck just averaged it out. Maybe they didn't know how to look carefully. This should be cleaned out exactly before uh, we, uh, we all understand it. But Chaolin, maybe you want to? It's not, it's not that significant. It's, it's about three sigma. But also, there are other three sigma type thing okay. of Planck with other. So I'll, I'll wait and see. One more here. Uh, essentially, well, Wait, if, if you look at the possible statement that this R is 0.16 plus minus 0 
So then if you make this one sigma, then you're already 0 0.1 and 0 0.1 is two, whatever. Yeah, but you're right, this is about three sigma maybe. Uh, would you like to speculate on whether nonlinear gravity waves could also have a very small contribution that might be detectable and testing theories more seriously than the linear calculations that gave rise to these results? What, what means uh, contribution of gravitational waves? This is what he studied. Uh, he studies imprint of uh, gra uh, gravity waves produced during inflation. I said nonlinear gravity waves, not linear ones. I asked if there could be a signature of nonlinear gravity non waves. Nonlinear effects are pro uh, hard to believe because the contribution should be suppressed by, well, uh, uh, energy scale is not enough. If energy scale would be Planckian, then nonlinear effects would be very, very important. But if energy scale, as we see right now, is approximately, that's one of the goals of the experiment, to establish the energy scale of inflation. So apparently, the last stages of inflation, energy scale approximately 10 to the minus 9 of Planckian. So nonlinear effect most probably are not there if it is just normal gravity. And that's what we are checking. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, let's thank Andre again. <laughs> It's really wonderful what the speakers are doing. They're already introducing the next speaker every time. So Andre just talked about Eva Celestine's model. Um, I want to thank her for actually helping me bounce off some ideas to put this program together. And while she's setting up, uh, it's, to me it's a pity that our founding uh, director, Roger Blanford, isn't here. He, poor thing has to be in the Dolomites in some really tiny little village and it's gorgeous. <laughs> and the, the owner of the bed and breakfast came with a newspaper uh, and showed him the video the video, as it's known now. Um, um, okay, how are we doing? No, no. It's, it was, uh, ah, very good. Can you make it full screen? Okay, I'll okay. also keep you to time. Awesome. Okay, th <laughs> thank you, Tom. Thank you for organizing this wonderful event. And <clears throat> let me start by giving my congratulations again to Chow Lin and the whole BICEP team. This is just magnificent. And also congratulations to Andre and the pioneers of inflationary theory and the perturbations. It's, it's just stunning. Um, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, so, so the subject is incredibly important for all the reasons that Chow Lin and, and Andre already explained. I'm gonna unpack for you uh, one of the comments that uh, they each made having to do with one of the very basic ways in which this physics is sensitive to quantum gravity, which um, by which most of the time here I'll take uh, to mean string theory. Um, but we can begin in a very uh, model independent way with a relationship that is known as the lithe bound, although it's not a bound. In fact, it's been um, strongly violated. This relationship, which I'll review actually on the next slide because it is a one line argument, um, says that in the simplest uh, scenario for inflation, there's this inflaton field which is rolling on a potential energy, and you can ask how far does it go in units of, of energy, let's say in units of the, the Planck mass scale. And there's a simple relation in the simplest uh, scenario for inflation in which this is related to the observable that Chow Lin has told us about, the tensor to scalar ratio uh, in this way. Um, when the field rolls farther than this Planck mass scale, the situation is what we call highly ultraviolet sensitive. If you think about what kind of physics could complete our theories of particle physics and gravity, if you know nothing about it, if you just think about it from the bottom up, you would say there could be contributions to the effective Lagrangian of that theory, which contain terms in, say, the potential energy that we draw in inflationary theory, which uh, involve powers of the field suppressed by this Planck mass scale. That's in some sense the most conservative thing you might expect. And so the range exceeding that scale by quite a margin now, according to Chow Lin and company, uh, means that all these corrections must be suppressed. And this is a strong statement about the theory of quantum gravity that underlies uh, are low energy physics. Um, they mu this feature must be determined somehow by quantum gravity. It could be a statement about symmetries of the theory along this inflaton direction, which may be weakly broken, and that's in fact our best idea to understand this. 
Um, as a consequence, in the context of string theory, which is our most well-developed candidate for quantum gravity, uh, this physics tests our large field inflation examples and also, as Andre explained, um, falsifies very interesting possibilities at low R. So it does both things. So let me explain this lithe bound. Uh, one starts with the expression for the number of E-foldings of inflation. A here is the scale factor. So the number of E-foldings is the integral of dA over A during inflation. So use the chain rule a couple times. There should be an over A here. There's a little typo. Um, and so use a chain rule a couple times. It's very sophisticated mathematics, as you can see. Um, <laughs> And you can uh, transform this expression into this combination, where instead of integrating over the scale factor, you integrate over the field phi as it rolls along its potential. Put it in Planck units, and the coefficient here turns out to be a square root of the inverse of this tensor to scalar ratio. So I haven't explained this part. It's just the variance of the scalar and tensor fields that are around during the process. Uh, but if you plug this in here, you see this, this relation that I mentioned on the previous slide. So it's a very general thing. And again, it was first uh, kind of expressed as a quote unquote bound. There was a theoretical prejudice, at least in some quarters, that, that you know, this would be insane to have all those corrections uh, gone. So there was a, there's a big yes, no question in, in experiment, which BICEP has, has uh, answered in the affirmative. But you know, in a, in a, even in the, at the theoretical level, there was, there was this basic yes, no question of whether large field inflation uh, made sense. And uh, the answer is yes, it makes sense uh, in a way that's very elegantly tied to the mathematical structure, the structure of gauge symmetries in string theory, um, and involves, sorry, certain fields known as axion fields, which are in fact related to Helen Quinn's early work in the field. Um, so, uh, the range of the field gets effectively enhanced if you have multiple fields, and string theory contains many degrees of freedom, so that's an interesting idea. But in fact, in each direction in this kind of field space, in scalar field space, uh, there's an effect which we call monodromy, which extends the field range in a simple way. So these fields I'm talking about basically, just, I'm going to try and give you in one minute a sense of how this works. Um, these fields descend essentially from higher dimensional analogs of electromagnetic potential fields. So there's some scalar field that you get by integrating over extra dimensions, some electromagnetic potential field. And the action contain is gauge invariant. It's the usual Maxwell type term, sort of a generalization of that. And a term that respects the gauge symmetries of the theory where the gauge potential, as in normal electrodynamics, shifts A goes to A plus D of some lambda. Uh, with the second field I've written here, theta, transforming in a compensating way. So the theory is completely gauge invariant. Um, this theta, the derivative of theta integrated around, say, a circle is, a, is, a, is quantized. So there's some quantum number q, um, and there are different branches of the theory on di for different choices of this q. And what, what you get out of this is a potential energy that depends directly on the axion field, which descends from this potential field. Um, it's not periodic on each branch of, of the theory. Uh, it goes off to a large field range in a completely consistent and controllable way, um, while at the same time, the underlying theory has a periodicity. Um, so I've described this in a kind of fancy way, but uh, by the way, another accurate picture of it is just like a wind-up toy. Um, so the, in, this, in this theory, large field ranges appear in a natural way for each of these axion fields, of which there might be multiple, multiple copies. Um, so uh, the robust prediction from, from this structure is large field range and, and, and therefore a uh, tensor scalar ratio that has to be much bigger than this life bound, which, which uh, is down at 0.01. Um, and uh, that seems to have been confirmed, which is a wonderful thing. Um, so now, um, a week ago or whatever, we got wind of this amazing result. And I think, as everybody is saying, the actual range of possible values is, has not settled down yet. It might, it's, it's non-zero to great significance, uh, assuming the, the result holds up uh, as, as primordial, et cetera. Um, but it's very interesting, theoretically, to think about what ranges of R, uh, R arise through these various mechanisms. And um, for a long time, we were focusing on a regime where 
the potential goes like some power p less than or equal to two, typically less, um, because of the structure I gave where there was a sort of a squared term plus back reaction on other degrees of freedom that, that flattened the potential. Um, that's what those dots on the plots uh, indicate. There seems to be other examples like this in which one starts with higher powers of the, of the vector poten potentials also appearing in some corners of string theory, uh, which may give higher values of R, but that's very much in progress. So um, this is, for the first time, I would say data-driven string theory phenomenology um, thanks to the CMB and BICEP. So let me, let me just stop there and flash this last slide. <laughs> Thanks, <Ian. laughs> That's my way of controlling time. I never had to hug anybody yet. Yeah, uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Thanks, sorry. Eva. Sorry. Uh, one quick question for Eva. Actually, Eva, can I ask you something about, uh, is there a sort of a simple pictorial way for us to sort of think about quantum gravity in the sense you were sort of describing? What that, um, do you have sort of a? Well, so the, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's interesting to ask about a picture, but the, the equation is really, you know, fairly simple. If you think at all about, um, about quantum mechanics or quantum field theory, you, or just even some lattice model of a condensed matter system, if you don't know what's going on at very high energy scales, you tend to parameterize your ignorance of that by allowing for all terms in the, in the effective action of the theory, just the Lagrangian of the theory, which are consistent with the symmetries and, and which are, um, you know, have, have a characteristic scale associate, associated with them uh, corresponding to that short distance scale. So here we're being totally conservative. We're saying there's this very high scale we know of in physics, the Planck scale. Let's consider all the contributions that are, you know, suppressed by that huge scale. And the beautiful thing about inflation beyond the original motivations is that this, the, the process is sensitive to those corrections. It really is. It doesn't mean you can turn it around and take the, the data uh, and decide which quantum gravity model it is. Both statements are, are true, but they're, and they're consistent. But, but it's, it's, it's this equation. It's just Taylor expansion, really. So symmetries can help control that. And that's what we think could be what's going on. So. Great. Let's thank Eva again. <laughs>uh, and uh, I was asked to give some remarks about the B-mode polarization, and so let me start with the history of uh, B-modes. Uh, I thought actually this history started here in this paper where, you know, I said the uh, particular combination of Stokes Q and U parameters vanishes for scalar-induced uh, polarization, thereby allowing an uh, unambiguous determination of tensor modes. This was back in the summer of 96. Uh, but then I went back and actually realized that version 1 actually had F instead of B. Uh, I didn't know at the time that F was not a very good word in English. I'm not a native English speaker, so... <laughs> a month later, we changed uh, to E and B. And this was a small-scale uh, uh, analysis at the time. Uh, the, uh, and uh, as I said, a month later, the more powerful all-sky analysis came, where we decomposed uh, Q and U, uh, the two Stokes parameters, on the sky into so-called spherical um, uh, spin-weighted harmonics, uh, and then to linear, particular linear combinations of E and B, for which, uh, as we heard it before, E uh, is a scalar one, and only scalars contribute to it, and B is the one that is a pseudoscalar, and therefore scalars do not contribute to it, and gravity waves can. So at the same time, we also made the first predictions, and the pr first predictions already shown that there are two bumps, um, the so-called recombination uh, bump at L of 100, and reionization bump at L of uh, 10, and they both had kind of similar amplitudes, and uh, the amplitude was around 0.05 microkelvin if you assume the tensor to scalar ratio was 1. So at that point, the experimentalists started to pay attention because even though this was, you know, orders of magnitude below the sensitivity at that time, you know, there was no reason why one could not one day achieve this sensitivity and therefore make a measurement of this. So um, unfortunately, a year later, another um, effect to generate B modes was, uh, was uh, found, which is due to the lensing 
uh, distortions along the line of sight, one can uh, create B modes out of E modes. And uh, we did these calculations, uh, and we have shown that this actually has uh, peaks at a smaller angular scales, so roughly at L of 1,000. And the amplitude depends, uh, the amplitude is actually well known for this one. The amplitude of this one, of course, the primordial gravity, depends on what the you know, tensor to scalar ratio is. If it's one, then it's visible. If it's not, if it's a lot less than one, then it would be below the lensing, and that would be a problem. Okay, so fast forward now to uh, actually July uh, of last year when the first detection of B modes, of the lensing induced B modes, was reported by SPT. I'm showing here the results. Uh, this was an exciting result in the sense that it demonstrated that experimentalists can actually measure these B modes and uh, unambiguously demonstrate that this can be uh, observed. But, um, and of course, they this does tell us something about um, the nature, but it tells us more about the gravitational lensing effect. And then fast forward, of course, to, ne to the Monday, um, uh, where we uh, have uh, seen that there was almost an order of magnitude uh, improvement, and we have seen this plot already. So um, I want to now switch and, uh, oh yeah, before I, uh, before I talk about this, the imp implication of these results, I want to just say that you know, one of these uh, points you see here, you see that there's a lot of still weak lensing, still has a lot of con contamination compared to the gravity waves. How can we remove this thing? In fact, there is a technique to remove this, which is to use the four-point function of the CMB to try to reconstruct the lensing potential on long line sight and then use this information to de-lens uh, the B modes and therefore dig deeper down into the primordial uh, B modes. That's a technique that uh, you know, has been developed, at least theoretically, and here I'm just showing how much improvement one can make, at least uh, in principle, one can make you know, uh, up to a factor of 30 improvement in this. And if that were the case, actually, then we could actually be observing gravity wave modes even at uh, L of 300. All right, but this is already two days old news, so let's move on and ask, I mean, is bicep consistent with uh, Planck? On the face value, it's not because Planck upper limit is 0.11 at uh, 95%. One way to fix this is to introduce uh, running. Uh, Bicep team did already this, and in fact, what you need is uh, to fix this is you need pretty large running uh, of um, you know, minus 0.027. Uh, this is ugly. Why is it ugly? Because it would actually rule out all of the inf nice inflation models that we have heard about them before. They do not uh, predict this large running. And I actually don't really like running, so... Um, <laughs> The reason I don't like running is, uh, besides <laughs> the fact that I prefer biking or skiing, is that I actually, you know, it's incompatible with large-scale structure. So I don't think that is a solution. Instead, I think, I suspect that maybe bicep points could come down a little bit, not too, too much. Um, so one question, for example, is why are the bicep uh, points very high here? Uh, if, there are, if there's some common, you know, perhaps T, B mixing that also contributes here and here, then all these points could come down a little bit. That's just a speculation, of course. Uh, the other uh, point you will notice is that the cross correlation between bicep and CAC is lower, and it does not have a high L points. Uh, and if you just fit to these points, then again, you get something of R of, of roughly 0.13 or so. So uh, foreground emission has already been mentioned. This has not been subtracted, but if you subtract just a little bit, maybe this will bring it down a little bit more. So maybe, you know, at the end of the day, we will settle the, when the dust settles, we will end up at roughly 0.1. Um, and uh, I should also mention that there is some correlation between uh, tensor and scalars and, and the slope, and so slope actually does go up a little bit as well. So where are we then on this plot? My current uh, best bet is that we are somewhere around here. Um, in terms of tensor to scalar ratio, NS maybe some around here. And if you ask then what are the two most, uh, the best fit models, you know, M square, phi square is one of them, and the other one is a monotomy that we already heard from Eva. And so it may very well be that uh, we will in the future be uh, focusing on these models. And what the thing that I want to emphasize is that eventually we can measure this number R to about 1%. Not a 1% of 1, 1% of 0.1, okay? This is, can be, so just these models, uh, the dif difference between these models can be, you know, tens of sigma um, eventually if we ever get to uh, measure all sky and all that. So uh, a new era of precision test at the gut energy scale and uh, string cosmology has begun. Thank you. All right, questions for Raj.
Well, I'm just thrilled that uh, we had a Berkeley professor, um, you know, really vote for two Stanford models uh, on his last slide. <laughs> So I'm a little overcome and don't know what uh, question to answer now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? If not, we'll move on to Ryan Kiesler. Let's ask her. Okay. Thanks, Ur. <clears throat> Again, Urs did a, phen a phenomenal job motivating the next talk. Uh, this is Ryan Kiesler. He's a Kavli fellow. Uh, here at KaiPak, uh, arrived in the fall, and the most memorable event for me on Monday was that he was telling the Bicep 2 team that uh, they should remind him that he never wants to play poker with them, because uh, <laughs> he's been here for months and really hadn't heard anything about this yet. Um, thanks, Ryan. On the bottom? Ah, thank you. Okay, there we go. So yeah, I think I'm I'm up here to um, give you know the the view of this from the point of view of another CMB experimentalist, and it's a real real honor to do this. Um, I I have not been involved with BICEP2. I work on another telescope here in the background called the SBT. Um, and we have a real special relationship. We share this building at the South Pole called the Dark Sector Laboratory. Um, and as you can see by even the image used to advertise this talk, uh, we kind of end up hogging the spotlight on accident a lot, right? We're always in the center of these photos. Here's a beautiful, beautiful photo from Stefan Richter. And this is... <laughs> This is better because uh, biceps in the foreground and it's you know, kind of bigger looking than SPT. So you think, surely you can't botch that, um, but you can. So this is the Guardian. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, I think you have your spotlight now though. So basically I'm just here to sing bicep to his praise, really. Uh, it's a truly cutting edge instrument in every sense of the word. Uh, the camera with these polarimeter on a chip type detectors, um, you know, this is the most sensitive polarization sensitive camera uh, of, its, of its time, and the one that now holds that position was made by the same people. So it's, it's an amazing camera. The optics are incredibly clean and symmetric and cold and everything you want in a system like this. Um, the, the number and breadth of calibration measurements that have been made are astounding, and this is just... I mean, uh, now it all makes sense seeing all these people making these measurements at the South Pole over the past few years, trying to understand these systematics in great detail, and they do. And the analysis methods that we heard about are extremely important for this. Uh, you heard earlier that uh, these techniques enabled this detection to go from something like two and a half or three sigma to greater than five sigma. So that's a ton of work. And I mean, I just know that there were so many Saturday nights in the lab or Sunday mornings coding or time spent at the South Pole away from friends and family, and uh, it's all worth it. So, way to go. Uh, this is an extremely uh, busy plot, and this is um, the real meat for someone like me. This is uh, showing the limits on contamination to their signal from various systematic effects. And the bottom line is that they've looked into so many of these, and they're all much smaller than the signal they see. This is also uh, quite reassuring. Let's see if this works. This is, uh, you've seen this before, but this is again correlating BICEP2 data with BICEP1 data at a different uh, uh, frequency. So 150 gigahertz cross 100 gigahertz. And foregrounds would change quite a bit as you did this, especially dust. It would be something like three or four times dimmer. Um, and they still see a signal at about the three sigma level. So it's quite reassuring that it's not foregrounds. So we've heard a lot about possible tension with Planck, and I'm personally not very worried about this. So uh, this is, I just have flipped the constraint on R, uh, and this is the likelihood from BICEP after removing different foreground models. And this is just me grabbing some chain from Planck last night, and this is their you know, constraint on the same parameter. So uh, perhaps this is a personal you know, thing, but to me this does not scream huge tension. 
looking forward, uh, here's some you know, rough list of all these great experiments that are trying to uh, now measure this. I think Keck is going to be fantastic. It's the same area, so there's all kinds of cross-correlation that they've already done preliminarily, and that's going to be very solid, I think. Planck is especially interesting because um, it has the potential to measure this signal uh, on much larger angular scales and perhaps even get the reionization bump. And it also has uh, a wide frequency coverage going up to 220 gigahertz, which will be great for really eliminating the possibility that this is dust. So I just invite you to imagine what this will look like in the next few years as this is filled up going down uh, hopefully below L of 10, seeing the reionization bump, and measuring all the way up here uh, the lensing signal, and like Eros was saying, hopefully even delensing a significant amount to see this turnover in more detail. And this is going to just allow, you know, confirmation that this is not foregrounds, confirmation that this is nothing else going on, uh, ruling out more exotic things like patchy reionization or something causing this. Um, and measuring the tilt, which uh, I don't think, you know, it's been fixed throughout all this, but it's, it'd be nice to know the tilt of the tensor spectrum as well. So I'll just leave you with this uh, wonderful last sentence from the paper itself. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ryan. Do we have a question for Ryan? Let's see, who can we run to? In the back. So is there any prospect that SPT will be able to confirm this result, given the data you already have? Uh, I think it's promising, especially in cross-correlation uh, with the BICEP2 data. So I hope so, yeah. Actually, can I ask you, Ryan, yeah. like, uh, so with the delensing that you could do on the high L side, yeah. now that you have sort of a rough idea how high this is, you know, how far do you think you can push that? I mean, what's the, the highest L that you could imagine plausibly delensing? So I think if you imagine moving this curve down by a factor of two, that is definitely doable. Mm -hmm. um, and then it just gets harder and harder. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of, in your mind's eye, just look at this down yep. by a factor of two. <laughs> you're going to get uh, a bit more in L, but it's a pretty steep spectrum, so you're not getting a ton. Yeah. But every bit helps. Mm -hmm. you know. But you're thinking sort of that one bump extra we could still get? No. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <Yeah. laughs> Excellent. Any other question? Lance? Uh, can we get a microphone really quick? <laughs> for the people that are I guess there's a assuming. specific prediction for the tensor tilt and single field inflation. And the question is, is it <clears throat> conceivable to get that far? Which I think is 0.2 over 8, if I remember right. Or if, it's, if R is 0.2. So we're talking a few percent. Right. I think that's going to be hard, um, to be honest, because uh, a colleague of mine, Gil Holder, has already modified the, uh, the likelihood code from BICEP to fit for the tilt and gets uh, plus 0.75, plus or minus 0.75. So, well, now, yeah. yeah. But who knows, you know. Great. Let's thank Ryan again. <laughs> Um, and next up, we have uh, one of our newest members uh, of KIPAC and the Stanford physics uh, community, who looks very familiar to some people, I think, <laughs> uh, mostly because he did his PhD thesis here with Blas Cabrera, um, and invented and you know, sort of really worked out the technology for these transition edge sensors that Chao Wen uh, highlighted are so important to make these uh, very precise uh, measurements. And the talk works. Great. Okay. Thanks, Thank Ken. you. I had to load up a new talk because until Charles Lynn told me what my talk was on during his talk, I, I was going a little different direction. But, uh, <laughs> so I'm going to be talking about the transition net sensors and the squids, basically the, uh, the, super, the quantum mechanical condensed matter part of this experiment, which is unifying, I guess, quantum gravity and quantum cosmology using quantum condensed matter tools, which I think is kind of nifty. Um, and I want to start by just mentioning a little bit about heritage that um, a lot of the technology here was really worked out in the Cabrera group uh, 20 years ago and, and uh, more recently for the cryogenic dark matter search. And in fact, if you look at the BICEP2 paper author list, almost 10% of the people are, have come from the CDMS experiment, I guess realizing that it might be easier to find inflation than WIMPs. Um, <laughs> and uh, here's, 
Here's a list of some of them. And for instance, Walt, uh, who is uh, one of the, the key people now, but also Jeff Filippini, Sunil Gawala worked uh, on it at Berkeley, um, and myself. And uh, so there's a lot of heritage coming out of the Cabrera group, which I think is kind of neat after, after all these years. Okay, so uh, as Chellen mentioned, behind all these very, very clever interleaved phased antenna arrays that separate out the X and Y polarization and then pipe them out on little superconducting transmission lines is something that in principle is very, very simple, a thermometer. If you can just dump this polarization signal onto a resistor, you can measure the heat and you can measure the signal. And just about anything you can convert to heat, you can measure with a thermometer. What's remarkable though, is if you're cold enough, you can do this very, very sensitively. And in fact, you can do it sensitively enough that you're dominated just by the noise of the CMB photon fluctuations itself. And so basically, you just have a thermal heat capacity. As photons come in, for instance, an X-ray photon gives you a pulse, so it's easier to show. You see temperature go up, you measure that temperature rise, that's all you do, and that tells you how much power there is. And if you have two of them, you get both polarizations. Um, and a very nice sensitive thermometer is just a, a superconducting film, where if you bias it in transition right where it's going from normal to superconducting, the resistance is changing very quickly with temperature. Very, very sensitive. Um, so that's a basic idea, it's very simple. And you put a voltage across it, and that means that your resistance is transduced to a current. And it turns out that we also have very nice superconducting amplifiers, uh, superconducting quantum interference devices that are so much more convenient to use than FETs because they operate cold where the rest of the experiment is. Um, and, and, and the combination of these two technologies has been really enabling uh, for uh, really all the uh, uh, current generation of and, and future generation of, of CMB experiments. I believe that Ryan showed you his list of current and future experiments. And of those, I don't know, 15 or 20, only Planck was not transition head sensors and squids. All the rest were transition head sensors and squids. So that's some nice heritage. Um, but the basic idea is the current is transduced to a magnetic field, and the squid is an interferometer using superconductivity which turns out it has this periodic response that's a very sensitive response to that flux. So you end up getting uh, a, a current measurement on the x-axis, which gives you an output voltage that you measure. And there's an E-beam lithograph of one of the squids um, that were used in this experiment. So let's see. The other trick is, of course, multiplexing, that as you start getting up to many, many pixels that you need for things like bicep, you really can't run that many wires up to room temperature because there's too much heat that flows down. And so by, in, in one way you do it is you just switch the squids on, each of which is coupled to a TES one at a time, and you can measure the interleaved signal of all the sensors with a small number of wires. So that's all been made to work beautifully by the team in BICEP and has resulted in all this data along with all the other things that uh, Chowlin listed in his, in his uh, uh, talk. So that's a photograph of the BICEP2 arrays, which I think we've seen some. Uh, then around the outside edge, each one of these chips is a chip that has a bunch of squids on it. Each one of these is 32 squids, but only one output channel for each. So these are switch on one at a time. And I believe that there's 16 of these chips reading out all 512 of those pixels, and that's where all the data comes from. And the uh, chips that were used in this look something like this. This is actually zoom in on the end of that chip there, and you see little squids here. This is one particular generation. I don't think this is the one that was actually used. Um, but th it turns out these are actually quite complicated superconducting integrated circuits. Uh, there's, uh, since we're f there's 512 sensors, there's actually more than that. There's uh, thousands of squids that are used in the end to read out all these channels. So, and one thing I just wanted to remind people of is there's all these other experiments um, that Ryan's been working on, that many other people have been working on, that, have, uh, that are uh, pr contributing lots more to the CMB already and that are going to be important for refining and testing uh, these measurements of R. And of course, this is a very famous, this is the combined power spectrum from Planck, but then also showing all the high L power from the South Pole Telescope and the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. And, and all the statistical significance up at these higher angular resolutions are from these superconducting sensors. And uh, we've already talked about all of the uh, 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 de-lensing that's going to be necessary, and getting measurements at higher angular resolution is, is an important tool for that. Um, and this has already been shown also, is that the South Pole Telescope, by uh, correlating with the Herschel Spire cosmic infrared background, was able to pull out that lensing B-mode signal. Um, there's some of the data from that paper. 
also taken with these same devices, and, and, and this is an important pathfinder towards the delensing that has already been talked about in the last couple of talks. So I think I'll just uh, leave you with that, is that the hope that other superconducting transition net sensors with squids with different teams are going to be able to use to, uh, to delens all of this and, uh, and both prove that it's real and start to really constrain and measure all the parameters that the cosmologists want. So thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Kent. Do you have a question for Kent? She has sort of have a ba very basic one. I mean, so with these uh, TSs, they so uh, crazy sensitive. So in the development stage, now I think you talk a lot about building a lot more new sensors, right? Mm -hmm. so is, there, um, is there something else on the design that, uh, of the sensors themselves that you uh, say would really be helpful for the measurement, or? So, uh, it, for the C it turns out measuring the cosmic microwave background is relatively easy. It's just these slowly varying power levels, and the TESs are working as, bell as well as you need. It's all about the readout to make many pixels. Where the sensors themselves need to be tweaked is in measuring X-ray photons for things like LCLS or LCLS-2. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of work there for that. Uh -huh. Any other comments for Kent? Oh, I love it. I was so worried we're not going to be on time. <laughs> okay. Let's thank Kent yeah. again. Oh, scared us all to be fast. <laughs> we have one here. Yeah. Could you comment on how you uh, came up with the voltage bias TES okay. idea? Okay. Well, that was uh, the fact that Bloss is an eternal optimist, and we were uh, working on developing, you know, arrays of superconducting films, each of which were these very sensitive sensors, um, and basically trying to build large format arrays across wafers, and each one is a very sensitive thermometer, and each one is a very sensitive thermometer at a slightly different temperature, and so. It was just the horrible problem of how can we make them all sensitive at the same time. And the realization was that if you voltage bias them, they naturally self-regulate because the joule power uh, dissipation is V squared over R. So as one of the TESs gets a little bit colder, its resistance goes down, and then V squared over R goes up, and that heats it up again. And so all you have to do then is voltage bias them all, read them out with squids, and cool down the bath to well below the TC, and they all uh, independently bias in the transition. Then they get faster, and then you can use squids, and they're linearized, and all sorts of other wonderful things come out. All right, thanks, Ken. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, we have another uh, member of the Stanford community, uh, Leonardo Senatori. Um, he really, uh, I know he's a huge fan of uh, quantum field theory. He likes effective field theories uh, for inflation, but also for the large-scale structure of the universe as a whole. Um, I really like the way the guy thinks. Uh, so we had on Monday, uh, as the announcement was happening in Harvard, we sort of had an event, and we made Walt Ogburn give two talks, uh, which was amazing. No? Uh, they kept getting better. So actually, Tuesday, you gave another talk. It was great. Um, but you know, Leonardo was the guy that did think about bringing Spumante. Uh, to actually really celebrate. I love how you think. Ah. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, I didn't hear you, sorry. So, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak in this uh, remarkable event. I would like to focus a bit on what we learn from this discovery. And uh, of course, we all know that uh, the universe was very hot that started with inflation. And to me, this is uh, really a milestone for mankind. I mean, it's uh, one of the most pristine questions we all had. So for this, I would like to give my congratulations, my personal thanks to Charlie Kuo for the, and the Basel II collaboration for the discovery, and also to Luther, Guth and Linde for the formulation of inflation. I'm just highlighting the local guys, but uh, we know that also inflation paper was a slack paper. So what do we measure the, by the, with the mean modes? No, the standard story is that uh, we measure the scale, energy scale of inflation by saying that the gravity wave signal is proportional to h squared over n plus squared, and if you use uh, the Einstein equation that tells you that uh, the potential is related to Hubble by this formula, you get uh, that uh, the potential energy during inflation was 10 to the 16 GV. And this is a fantastic energy scale. This is, this is uh, an incredibly high energy scale. Tells you that the universe was very, very hot. Uh, but also, it highlights that, that, that this scale is remarkably close to the grand unification scale. And so it's a further evidence that maybe we have a, a grand unified theory up there in the ultraviolet. 
And also, this is, is clearly, they will tell that the universe was very hot in the past, and so we'll have a, a tons of implications for uh, particle physics and beyond the standard model physics, because the new particle we think they are there, they are, must live in a universe which is very hot. So this, was, uh, this is really awesome. Mm. But uh, how, wh what uh, we want to know now, now you know that inflation happened, how in detail did inflation happen? And I would like to, 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 give a, a, to, to show a sort of lesson that one can draw, because of, uh, just in contradiction to what uh, I just said, I think that the amplitude of the signal is not necessarily associated uh, with the Hubble radar inflation, and there is a possibility of even a larger signal that can dominate uh, the production of gravitational waves from the vacuum than uh, the, standard, the one we just heard. And also this uh, uh, touches another highlight of the discovery, which is the gravity waves are not necessarily of quantum origin. However, what we remains, uh, we remain is that scale invariance of the signal remain a strong uh, a robust prediction of inflation. And this is what we saw. In fact, uh, if, you, if you look at the signal that we just measured uh, in the standard story, that is uh, hub, uh, graviton squares equal Hubble square of n plus square, then the amount of energy stored uh, in this graviton uh, around Hubble, time, uh, Hubble cross is about Hubble to the four, where Hubble is the curvature rate during inflation. Now, this is a, a very, very minuscule number. If you take an harmonic oscillator with frequencies of order Hubble, its vacuum energy is of order Hubble. So this, the fact that the energy density during inflation, the one we probed uh, in the standard story, is Hubble to the fourth, means that there is one quantum graviton per Hubble volume. And this is uh, minuscule. It's like, uh, it's like, consider, our universe now is inflating again, eh? and like having one quantum graviton in the full universe. Go and measure it. Good luck. <laughs> so it, it's, a, it's a very small number. And in fact, in the normal universe, we look for different sources of, of gravitational energies, because it's very easy, it seems, to beat this signal. In fact, in inflation, there is another source of energy, which is the, the, the motion of, there is a physical clock in inflation, the inflaton, and this inflaton goes at the speed uh, as a kinetic energy over the H dot and plan square. If you use uh, what we know about the temperature power spectrum, you actually know what, how much is this energy scale. It's m about 10 to the 10 Hubble to the fourth, which is much bigger than, 10 to the four, than Hubble to the fourth, by 10 or zero magnitude. So there is a lot of energy, like in our universe, during inflation, sitting there, potentially giving much more gravitational waves than what, in a, in a truth, in a naive story, we, are, we think we are detecting. In fact, if you were the, to convert all these, gravitation, all these energies into these gravitational waves, you will get a signal which is uh, epsilon, which is uh, several orders of magnitude before, above the one, is, the one has been detected. So potentially, there is a lot of energy that could be converting gravitational waves. It, the, no, it's the story is that the normal story, this energy is not used. It just sits there idle and doesn't do anything. So, here I give you a, counter, a proof of principle, a counterexample where instead uh, the source of gravitational energy, uh, uh, the source of gravity is of gravitational waves is given by these kind of m models. Imagine that uh, using these energies, imagine that there is a slow roll inflationary potential with some wiggles, some periodicity. These are very similar to the models that Eva showed that come from string theory to explain the current tensor to scalar ratio. So imagine that at each uh, maximum of this potential, there are some particles whose mass is being controlled by the inflaton phi. Gets, uh, g goes to zero when uh, phi reaches the, point, the top. Then, at, at periodically in time, the mass of this particle goes to zero, and there is a quantum production of, uh, of these particles, which is controlled by the speed of the change of uh, the speed, the rate of change of the mass, which is phi dot cube. So you, pr you can do the calculation, and you produce a number density of particles continuously as they are continuously replenished over the phi dot to the free half. So you see that uh, in this way, one is able to use this huge amount of energies and b do something with it, convert it into particles. And now these particles are there in the Lecitter epoch, and maybe we just need to convert to gravitational waves. And it's very easy to, to, do, to convert them in gravitational waves. Suppose that this particle decay into some other particle. When they, de they decay, they emit uh, gravity wave through Brennstrahlung, very much like any electrical charge particle, when decays, it emits Brennstrahlung of photons. Here, you, gravity is the, same, is the same as photons. It's just uh, you emit Brennstrahlung radiation of gravitons, whose uh, energy density is much, much higher than the one uh, produced by the quantum fluctuation, because it was very easy to beat that one. In fact, you can check that this gives, uh, imp about after some engineering, a detectable signal, even if Hubble was 10 to the minus 5 smaller than the number that we have today. 
So, in principle, uh, this um, Hubble could be five orders of magnitude smaller than what we have today, which is not a tragedy. I mean, the universe was still very hot. Not 10 to the 13 GV, but maybe 10 to the 8 GV, which is still pretty good to me. But uh, it just tells you that uh, there is a bit of a bad uh, part in the story. That is, uh, the amplitude of the signal is not necessarily associated with the, with the Hubble rate. And also, these are, this brestralum is a classical process, so this signal is not necessarily quantum. But instead, uh, as a, it's a scale invariance, because uh, it's scale invariance, so th this is the remainder of the prediction of inflation. And also, this story tells you that there is another mechanism, so very good. I mean, it's easier to, to have inflationary model that will make, uh, we can produce this kind of signal. And also, this signal are possibly non-Gaussian, as uh, I will explain in a second. Uh, the, the reason why density perturbations, the CMB fluctuations, are Gaussian is because uh, no, are, um, are thought as to be being quantum fluctuations of a field who is in a vacuum. And if the field uh, is weakly coupled, the, the vacuum uh, is very well described by the vacuum of a harmonic oscillator, which has a Gaussian distribution. Now, in the mechanism that I just told uh, with Brestralum, the fluctuations are not vacuum fluctuations, are Brestralum fluctuations, and so they're very non-Gaussian. So if, I, I think it would be interesting to do the analysis of non-Gaussianities uh, of the b modes. Uh, and in fact, uh, now they can, uh, because the signal is so large uh, that the skewness of the distribution goes like one of the square root of the number of modes. And already, if they detect it from 50 to 200, uh, they can already say 10%, 20% limits on the skewness of the distribution, which it's a, it's a new observable that I think uh, now that we have a detection is, uh, is interesting to, to probe. And uh, as I said, uh, Scale invariant instead uh, is what remains. The, it's very hard uh, to make a signal for manifolding which is scale invariant if you're not in the seat space. In fact, the fact that uh, the signal is scale invariant is because everything occurs in inflation always in the same way. The system, nothing changes as time goes on. In fact, uh, you could try to ask yourself, can you make uh, scale invariant fluctuation without being in inflation, without being in the seat space? Uh, and uh, for, uh, if you imagine that you have a, a single scalar degree of freedom, there is a theorem that uh, it tells you you cannot do it. Uh, but you can with one field, as uh, Andrei mentioned. With more than one field, you can, even though you have to work very hard uh, and anesthetically, but you could. Instead, uh, now we're working on a theorem that it tells you that really, if you see scale invariant gravitational waves, there is no way out. Uh, it's just uh, impossible to produce scale invariant fluctuations without uh, uh, even no needing to know the model. Because uh, if the universe changes uh, as uh, time goes on, you will get. Uh, the gravity waves will change, it will not be scale invariant. So I think this motivates for us uh, a lot the analysis of the tilt uh, to, be scale, to, to check how much is scale invariant. And I think 10% constraints would be very useful and you can easily do, I think. Okay, last thing I want to mention is uh, this is about the details of inflation. Let me also mention how another question that opens up now, which is how did inflation begin? So, because uh, as you heard, there is a very mild tension with Planck. I, I, I don't think this is statistically significant yet, but there is uh, some. And this tells you that maybe the scalar fluctuations, which what Planck sees, uh, are smaller or large angles. This would be naturally associated uh, with uh, a steepening of the inflationary potential at the beginning, uh, while the low L mode were produced, uh, which can be easily associated uh, with uh, us originating from some bubble nucleation, like in this case. This, uh, I think, would be interesting to check in the data and to make this anomaly maybe uh, statistically significant because uh, this can be done both in large angle CMB, like by Planck, and also by large structure surveys. Because uh, if uh, we begin to see this kind of effect, we will not only have learned that inflation happened, which now we know, but uh, we will begin to see how inflation started. So I think. Uh, Inflation gravitational waves, uh, let me conclude by saying that they've been discovered, and this is just beautiful, I think, for all of us. But now, after we celebrate, we are fully celebrating, we, we will want to know how inflation happened and how it started. So this is not being ungrateful to the people who discovered that, <laughs> but as normal uh, in science, after any, disco any discoveries bring us the possibility of raising new questions, and new questions being answered. And so we will try to do that. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Leonard. <laughs> Great. Do we have a question for Leonardo? Oh, people help me a little bit. Can I ask a question? Thank <laughs> so you. So, with a, um, actually, w uh, what would sort of happen um, for us to sort of measure a little bit, uh, or how long we would have to get to sort of know how many doublings happen during inflation? What what types of observations, what 
be able uh, to constrain that? How long was inflation? Yeah, I mean, uh, given, uh, well, uh, uh, to, to know this number precise, we would need to know the, the heating temperature of the universe, and this uh, is kind of uncertain. You, th there is ideas to see it through the stochastic uh, gravitational waves, mm -hmm. which is very high. Mm -hmm. However, if uh, we see a change of slope uh, in the potential, which like this Planck, if uh, this Planck anomaly becomes statistically significant, this is one of the best, simplest way to go, then you would see the beginning of inflation. So you would know that, okay, what we are seeing is the beginning. So mm -hmm. all the inf all the we are, what we are seeing in the universe are all the modes, the inflationary mode that happened. Mm -hmm. Do we have another question for Leonardo? All right, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Thanks again. <laughs> mm. Our next speaker is uh, Renata Kalash, another colleague uh, from the Stanford Physics Department. We celebrated her uh, a very nice birthday with her last year, um, during which Andre gave a, a speech where a number of us, at least my table I was sitting at, uh, most of us were just crying. Um, so there's wonderful things to sort of say about it, and I was trying to sort of say uh, very nice things about your work. But many things have changed. You have become an internet sensation. Um, <laughs> uh, you can find information under the hashtag Instahug. <laughs> uh, and so with Charlotte's first discovery, uh, uh, your impulse to first give him a hug, uh, I think really endeared you to the world. Uh, anyhow, welcome, Renata. <laughs> So uh, there are many things one can say, but I have five minutes. So the decision what to say I made in the plane. Uh, and so I, I was mostly curious about this picture. And of course we know the picture is known for a while, but let me tell you my understanding. First, uh, everybody who knows general relativity knows when we will use, when we'll get uh, gravity waves from interferometers. This is what we'll see. We'll have uh, plus polarization, and cross polarization, everybody knows this. So we will actually s have the test particle moving. There will be two different things happening. And we have not done it from all I know. LIGO, uh, they just hope to find it. From strong gravity, uh, gravitational effects like uh, merger of gr uh, black holes and things like that. So we have not seen it. And this is the effect of passing gravitational waves through detectors. Now, uh, because Lance is here, I'm happy to tell him. That, so we talk about these two helicity states of the graviton. And for everybody who, who, who does quantum field theory, it is obvious we talk about electromagnetic waves and we talk about photons. And this is well known about wave-particle duality. Now we have something analogous happening. And um, so let's recall those two polarization uh, modes of gravitational wave, and those are plus polarization, and those are cross, and k the momentum goes like that. And so this is associated with these two helicity states. Everybody knows if we have graviton scattering, this is what we have. Uh, but in terms of a wave, this is what we have. And so it is certainly a clear distinction between gravitational wave and, say, uh, electromagnetic waves, because they're different, but they also have two physical states. So the polarization pattern for anybody who knows, you know, formal equation of motion uh, knows what is gravitational waves. So what many particle physicists, including me, wouldn't know what it has to do with the sky. <laughs> so here's what. So there are cold and hot spots. And because of these two things, somebody did the analysis and tells to a particle physicist that what you supposed to see that around the cold spots, it could be something like that or like that. And for hot spots, again, it is either like that or like that. And this goes by the name of E mode, which is something which is the gradient of a function in the uh, metric perturbation. Whereas this one, it's called B mode, and what people um, like Chaolin know from this side well, or, or Urash, for a particle physics, it, uh, there is no contact of concept of cold or hot spot for a particle physicist. However, in the end of the day, what is important here, 
that if you know that there are two states of polarization, somehow on the sky you should see this picture for transfers, traceless gravitons. <laughs> and this is what happened. Um, here's the picture. So <laughs> there was this small movie, and some of you may have seen it, and out of context, I am pointing my finger and I am saying <laughs> it's all there. And this is what I meant, literally. Uh, so I meant that when I was shown this picture, uh, my reaction was, here is this uh, hot spot, and here is this um, direction, and here is a cold spot, and this is the opposite direction. So I knew those are gravitons, which they kind of detect on the sky, although they are not the one which you would see on, on uh, interferometers. But they were there. And so for me, it was... The, yeah, no, it is kind of... <laughs> <laughs> you know what, this, this is from uh, a lecture long before uh, BICEP, and I think they just had plus minus difference of orientation. But I think for explaining, it will be good enough. So I, w what I was pointing to this picture, that they have both of them. And for me, it was like a, a signature of a graviton, which they have. Because this is the case of traceless and uh, transverse state of a graviton, which you see on the sky because of this. So let me go to something which is close to what Leonardo discussed. I'll have probably more conservative attitude, uh, but still it just will tell you that the whole story is interesting. So this is um, from Gerhard Tuft uh, picture where here is what we know today. As much as we know is that uh, we have LHC and that Higgs is 126 GV. And we also know that people talk about mm, grand unification. And of course, we have the issue with Planck size. And now, oops, something is not, well, you should use your own computer, of course. This, it tells that um, I decided to call 0 0.2, 0 0.15. <laughs> for now. <laughs> 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 we'll see what will be. Just for an example. So this is suddenly, I, actually this is from my quantum field theory class. I use it to tell people that after we know everything we can from LHC, maybe, maybe, maybe we will have something 10 orders higher. And this will be quite significant. And this apparently is what happened. So how we can think about this uh, type of uh, discovery. So the first thing which comes to mind that we have, um, uh, the w when you know R, you measure H Hubble parameter during inflation, which is, uh, uh, Hubble is approximately 10 to the 14, and therefore the Hawking temperature, which is approximately associated with gravitational um, radiation of this kind, is 10 to the 13 GV, so we have here. On the other hand, some people really like to think in terms, uh, yeah, and so this is what, uh, if we think of um, a potential, this is h squared over 3, this is our uh, Hubble parameter, which is characteristic uh, energy scale for radiation energy. On the other hand, many other people like to think of uh, potential as a uh, cartic of the energy, and if we do that, then we come up with 10 to the 16 GV. And many people now like to, to call that, now uh, they probed for us grand unification scale. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, so in short, uh, where is this quantum gravity or part of it is coming? So the inflationary universe is a near decisor space and who knows, I have seen it before, I'll just want to tell you what is the analogy between primordial tensor perturbation and scalar perturbation. Everybody used to see this W map with scalar perturbation. We believe it's quantum field theory for scalar field in the near the Sitter universe. For, um, so this is what uh, the perturbations are in the metric, in conformal coordinates. This is exactly the equation which uh, Chao Li had in the form g mu nu equals t mu nu, but applied to this small uh, linear, in fact, uh, perturbation. And so what you see here is this equation. And then if you work through 
uh, and try to get the equation in the form in which it depends on cosmological time instead of conformal time, this is your equation for perturbation for both plus and x polarization. And now you want to compare it with quantized scalar perturbation, which everybody is happy about. And if you look at it, it's just exactly the same equation. And therefore, all you have to do at this point for the plus and cross uh, polarization, do the same analysis, which is quantum field theory analysis uh, of a massless traceless transfer tensor field during inflation. This is what you are getting. So you find the spectrum of primordial tensor perturbation and divide it by spectrum of scalar perturbation, and this is your famous R, which actually a function of K. And so there is an agreement that people say K is equal to something at certain value of K. Okay, so what we knew from Planck that general relativity and quantum field theory of the scalar field work well up to unknown energy scale of inflation. So if I take a conservative point of view and I say, well, now we learn the scale of inflation for generic case, not for, for the case which Leonardo discussed. So then I say, what we know now, assuming that BICEP will be confirmed by other instruments, which Planck people are telling me, I should say. Uh, then we would say general relativity and quantum field theory of the scalar field and quantum gravity in the sense of quantum field theory of gravitons in a near decider background. They work well up to energy scale of inflation at about 10 to the 13 GB. So I have more to say, but if my time is out. <laughs> it is. <laughs> okay, All I'll right. stop here. Okay, yeah. thank you, Renata. Thank you. Do, we have, do we have a question for Renata? Oh, uh, Joanne. Can you finish the slide? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> you asked. Need no microphone asked to finish this slide. <laughs> So what we heard a few times that this is what Planck gave us. This was shifted Planck by Spergel, and the rumor is Planck disagrees. And this is the sweet spot which uh, Bicep gave us. So where are we? Where is the sweet spot? Where will it be years from now? And this is the question. Nobody knows the answer. And therefore, all the attractors which we discussed our kind of preparation, whichever, so we can continuously move in this range. And once we have a spot which everybody agrees and is small, then we have a good starting point to understand what kind of models are working and which are not. Well, I'll stop about Higgs and Flash. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Renata. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So we actually now have time for a general discussion. Um, and I asked um, my fantastic colleague, uh, Stefan Funk, who, uh, who's been uh, at Kaipak, I think, since 2006 or so, um, is an associate professor uh, here at Slack, and he's the exact other way of the energy spectrum. Um, so he looks at the most energetic photons uh, coming from the universe uh, using the Fermi, Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. He worked on HESS before. Um, and he knows what it means to take out faint signals uh, out, of, uh, uh, out of data. Sure uh, okay. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, you're going to organize this a little bit for 30 minutes? Yeah, and you're, right. you're the thing that stands between us and wine. Yeah, okay. Okay, good. Yeah, well, okay, so I'm not going to, maybe I should have this, yeah. yeah. So obviously I'm not going to talk for 30 minutes because I didn't have anything prepared. Tom told me about half an hour ago that I was supposed to lead this discussion. Um, so I encourage everyone who might be confused by now about the theories behind it or the experimental data behind it or anything else to ask questions. Now is your time. Um, of course, before we start, I would like to congratulate Chao Lin uh, very much. He came about, and Andre, of course, uh, and many others, but I think this, this special result now came from a lot of effort that you put in. You came at about the same time as I came, uh, so I'm very proud of that. Um, 
And then about Andre, I have this funny story to tell about uh, Roger Blandford, who is unfortunately not here. He's the director, he was the director of Kaipak. And um, he likes to uh, think big, and he always encourages us to organize workshops about big questions. And one of his famous um, workshop ideas that he likes to have organized is what would it take, what value of R would it take to convince Andre to give up inflation? <laughs> I think he should, he, he can, he can uh, put this idea of a workshop to rest now. Um, so yeah, so if anybody has any questions about the data, the theory, anything else, please ask it now. Yes, oh yeah, thank you. Uh, there's a microphone coming. So no experimentalist likes to talk about somebody else's experiment, but how did Planck miss this? Hmm. Okay, I repeat the question, how did Planck miss this? <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, so I, I have no direct involvement in Planck, so I <laughs> can only uh, say a little bit of what I've heard. But I think Planck is trying to do a lot of different things. They're aiming for a lot of physics. And they're interested in things that go from very low L to very high L and how to tie them all together. And for example, they, they calibrate their experiment off of the dipole. And they have to go from there to these extremely fine resolutions and have everything in between completely well understood. So they need to know everything about their beams and their time constants in a very fine way. and. Um, I, I, I think they've been trying to get all of that nailed down, whereas we, we go really just for one science goal and try to do that extremely, extremely well. And um, yeah, so I can, I, don't, I can only guess that Planck w had no more suspicion than we did that we might find such a big signal. Um, the, this is what Andrew Lang always called the wild goose chase, right? And this, this goose is like elephant-sized, so. <laughs> Stefan, okay, right wants to, add to that, and, and I'm sure Sarah would like to add to that as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually on Planck. <laughs> yes. yes, okay, so how, okay. So what, everything that Walt said is completely correct. Um, to say that Planck missed this would imply that we published a power spectrum with zero primordial B modes. I haven't seen such a spectrum, okay? Analysis is ongoing and it will be published when the team is satisfied with the data. All right. uh, <clears throat> Just one other thing. In terms of sensitivity, bicep 2's sensitivity is roughly comparable with Planck's. But Planck surveys the whole sky, which is not completely optimized for, um, for this particular science goal. It does extremely well on other things like T and damping tail and all that. Do we have other questions? Yes. Thank you. I was wondering uh, if uh, some of the details could be further clarified on uh, the relation between inflation, uh, eternal inflation, and uh, these latest results and how those three things are related to each other. All right. Maybe, Andre, you want to talk to that? <clears throat> Well, it, eternal inflation could happen even at very, very low energy scale. It's actually very difficult not to have eternal inflation, especially if you have string theory, which has lots of different vacua, and even slow roll inflation is not necessary for that. If you have many different de Sitter type vacua, at least, then you can jump from one vacuum to another, then return back and jump to another vacuum. It goes just, well, on itself. Uh, if we are talking about only slow roll inflation, just like that, well, it was a surprising thing for uh, us when we found it, that even in this m squared phi squared simplest model, you can have eternal inflation. Now this, however, happens at huge values of the scale field phi. So for going there, you would need to go to the scales which are going to be available at us approximately at 10 to the degree, 10 to the degree, six years. So I am pretty safe that then uh, the uh, signal will be discovered. Uh, the, the main point, however, is that if you have inflation, it's very, very difficult not to have 
eternal inflation, especially if you take into account uh, this metastable vacuum string theory. Thank you, Andre. Um, actually, I have a question about um, the experimental data. You mentioned, or you particular mentioned, Jamie's work on um, taking the signal that seemed at a low significance and improving the analysis such that uh, ultimately you could claim this, this signal. Uh, could you talk a little bit about this part, or, or Jamie? Uh, like, like, what did it take? What did you have to do? Right, so the problem that Challen was referring to is just to make sure that the E-mode signal, which is much brighter, doesn't contaminate the B-mode signal. Um, so there's all these data processing um, techniques that we've developed to ensure systematics don't um, contribute to the B-mode signal. But then those uh, analysis techniques can also convert some of the E-mode signal into a, a B-mode signal. And we want to make really sure that we aren't contaminated in our final maps by any of these analysis steps that we've done. So, um, and once we've done that, um, we can make sure that the signal is clean and the variance from the E-mode signal doesn't contaminate the B-mode signal. And the improvement in the limits was really made by eliminating this uh, variance from the leakage. Right, right. And, um, so conce conceptually, um, it's, it's a, an idea that you just have to know exactly all the analysis steps that you've done and then form a, a basis of pure E and pure B modes for your particular observations. So these analysis steps that you do, you know exactly what you've done because you've, you've written the code to do them. And now you just want to make sure that the signal that you're looking at is a pure E or pure B for your particular observations. I asked a three year, why three years question. So when this was done with fractions of the data, how much contamination could you not rule out? Because that's implied in your answer that somehow this whole data was needed three years of analysis in order to then make the five sigma claim, which, and then the, that was explained, if I understood correctly, that was done by partitioning the data, looking at parts of it, not getting the answer, putting it back together, realizing it's there. Is that not true? Well, um, I mean, we, we primarily uh, break the data into, into halves in order to check for systematics. Um, and when we do that, we, we try to divide the data into, you know, the half that we think might be contaminated by some particular thing and the half that we th think wouldn't be. And then um, making that difference, you can check for systematics. Um, and since the signal is fairly large, I mean, we, I, I'm, I'm not sure, I think you were asking something about um, whether we could see it in, in half the data. How does the significance of the signal grow so, with time? So after, after Jamie's method, which is based on matrix, solving a giant matrix eigenvalues, and um, the residual noise is just dominated by instrumental noise, which goes down linearly as time. Basically, it's just one over integration time. So um, it goes down linearly. The significance would increase roughly linearly in, in the power spectrum space, which is uh, our proportions are. Okay. Uh, yes. So just to continue on this, um, so there is an excess power at high L, and which is above the lensing. And at the same time, you also provide this T, temp T mixing templates. And if you apply the template, and if you say it's non-zero, then you know, it seems like the best fit 
would prefer some value and would lower all the points down in perfect agreement with the cross creation between keck and bicep. So is this a coincidence or maybe there is still some uh, mixing in the auto power that is perhaps not there in the cross power? So the, the excess at high L, L of 200, really came from two bins. And if you just calculate the significance um, appropriately, I think it's about two and a half sigma or something for those two bins. So if you just calculate expected lensing from all the points, you know, parameterizing that as a, a single parameter, amplitude, lensing amplitude, it's perfectly consistent with one. So I, yeah, and, and also when we do um, bicep to keck cross, that seems to go away or move in the lower direction. So it, it, it appears to be consistent with just a fluctuation, noise fluctuation. Actually, I have another question for the theorists. So, um, so this morning when I was driving my car, I heard KQD forum and uh, it, by the way, you did a very good job there, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and uh, Leo Siskind was there and he was um, speculating that somehow in the data there's a hint of a signal that there are that supports the idea of multiverses. Can I, can anybody enlighten me on that? Yeah. Yes. So I never knew I never knew how these works, but but I found out this morning. So after I talk, they just cut me off. So I didn't hear what happened afterwards. I didn't hear Brian's screen. I didn't hear Lenny's. That was, kind of, that was interesting. So somebody else has to answer that. OK. Can somebody try to answer this? Or is it absolute pure speculation? Andre, maybe, or Eva, or? So did, yeah. you, answer, did you understand the question? Uh, yeah, I think this was a bit what I was highlighting uh, at the end part of my talk. That is, uh, the, the, the anomaly, the inconsistency with Planck, which is very mild, so, but if you imagine it's, it's inconsistent, uh, then uh, it suggests that uh, the scalar fluctuations at low L um, are smaller. So that uh, Planck, so Planck uh, it just seems the sum of scalar plus, plus tensor, and therefore there was no scalars no tensors, but uh, if the scalars went down and the tensor went up, uh, it can just mimic uh, the same signal. So you can imagine that uh, to accommodate uh, this big uh, value of gravitational waves in the temperature power spectrum, the scalar power spectrum in the temperature must go down a low L. This, uh, uh, while, for example, the gravitational waves seen by Planck should not go down. So this, uh, if this uh, it becomes true, then this suggests that uh, this, the potential changes slopes uh, like uh, low L. Like uh, if uh, we were seeing the onset of infl inflation happens when the potential, sorry, inflation happens when the potential is very flat. Uh, like seeing the first part which is not flat enough or just barely not flat enough and then be flattening. So if you, then you, this is what we see. And this is, I think is very natural. Uh, I, I think I'm interpreting uh, Lenny, but uh, I'm, I'm kind of positive, but uh, okay, I think it, this is what it, Then you can imagine that if I extrapolate back, this becomes a barrier. And, and uh, in fact, one of the most beautiful idea to start inflation is uh, if you come from a false vacuum tunneling through a barrier. So this would be like a barrier. For example, this solves uh, the most beautiful way, the flatness problem, the homogeneity problem. So yeah, maybe Andre wants to add uh, something. I mean, since uh, he's one of the inventors. So, so this. <laughs> But basically, with more data, we could look into that and possibly learn something about this yeah, barrier. Yeah, no, with more data, we possibly will know that there is a change of slope. Okay. The step to turn inflation, it's uh, how much you want to do it, how much you believe it. Okay. But I think the change of slope could become very significant, yeah. Hello? Yes, Lance. Oh, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes? Sorry. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the uh, how you dealt with systematic errors that crept in through, say, distortions in the lens that might alter the polarization or cross-couplings between various detectors and the uh, actual instrument. Who wants to take that on? Yes. 
Okay, so first of all, we try to address that um, in our observation strategy. So we're a small telescope, so we can actually rotate around the bore site. And this 180 degree bore site rotation um, really reduces the introduction of systematics that you mentioned, such as uh, polarization in the uh, induced by the lenses and things like that. So that really reduced it quite dramatically. Um, and then the second thing we do is we actually um, try to deproject uh, out any uh, T to P leakages uh, induced from things like um, A versus B uh, pointing mismatches. So uh, A being polarization in this way and B being polarization in this way. Um, and uh, we've been able to show that to ourselves because uh, the jackknife that I mentioned, for, for instance, of uh, boresite rotation is very sensitive to those kinds of um, uh, systematics. And so, uh, you know, it amplifies the signal in comparison to the fully co da data. So we were able to show that deep, these deprojection techniques actually brought it down significantly. Um, the, the next one you mentioned was crosstalk. And we actually did, um, you know, we ran forward sims of uh, precision measurements from our exper experiment. We spent a lot of the time, as uh, Ryan Kiesler mentioned, at the South Pole doing precision measurements on our instrument. Um, and for instance, we can, one of the other benefits of having a small aperture is that the far field is not very far away for us. So we can put a source on a building about 200 meters away and do very clean, images of every single beam in our uh, instrument. And we've actually taken those and uh, run simulations where we convolve the temperature map with those beams. I'm not talking like Gaussian uh, fits to those beams. We're actually talking, we take the stamps that we measure and convolve them on the sky. And, um, you know, and then we've also done measurements like very uh, in-depth crosstalk measurements and done forward sims of that. And that was the plot that Ryan showed, was showing where each of those lines fell. Uh, Lance had a question, right? <clears throat> Ask uh, Andre if, uh, to follow up on Leonardo's suggestion for resolving this slight tension, if we're sort of seeing the beginning of inflation, is that consistent with eternal inflation or, 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 um, or not? Well, <clears throat> if what we see, is, uh, well, some dumping of low L is a result of tunneling, then actually it's a strong indication of eternal inflation because when you are tunneling from metastable vacuum state, typically you stay there ages. And then during this time, uh, the universe expands exponentially. So uh, the total amount of false vacuum, so to say, become exponentially large. Then part of it uh, in, uh, exp uh, well, uh, decays and you have a bubble and each bubble is infinite universe and then you see there something but then you produce much more space where, which is not yet decayed. So if we see indication of tunneling, then this is a strong signal of eternal inflation close by. Whether this is actually a realistic thing or not depends on what do you think about the probability measure in eternal inflation uh, in, uh, well, in the multiverse. And this is a question which is not settled yet. Also, it depends on which of the models is better. Like, for example, in normal chaotic inflation, or in Eva Silverstein's model, you can have, uh, well, easily inflation at very large values of phi. Meanwhile, Lenny's assumptions are based on the assumption that the typical inflation is short. So you barely make 60 foldings. Then you can see, uh, well, the moment when the bubble was formed. Mm -hmm. But if you easily make one billion foldings, then you're never, never going to see. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions? Yes. <clears throat> One of the speakers <coughs> mentioned um, gravitational bremsstrahlung. I was interested to hear that because at SLAC we're very familiar with bremsstrahlung due to an electron, say, going near a nucleus and accelerating and radiating. We also call synchrotron radiation, often called magnetic bremsstrahlung. Now there's a third type of bremsstrahlung. I wonder, has it been observed? And is it as much weaker than other types of bremsstrahlung that I would expect? 
Can someone comment on that? Well, I know the quadrupole radiation pattern from binary pulsars has been seen. Even though I'm guilty of brought that up, I think Lance answered the question, so yes, I think uh, yes. It's, uh, what enters is only the fact that uh, if you have a massless particle, you will, you will emit softly, and this goes under the name of Brestralum. It's already in Weinberg book in 1960, it's called gravitational Brestralum. It's just the same, very similar formulas. Mm. So unless someone wants to speak up, I'll turn it over back to uh, Tom, and I think you should probably have all our Awesome. So now I am the last thing between you and a glass of wine. Um, okay, but I, I just want to do a couple of things really quick and just uh, thank a number of people. Um, I'm going to start out a little bit generic. Um, it's the, I want to uh, just thank Stanford University. Um, it's like, what a place to be at. Um, this is my 10th year here. Um, it's been amazing. Uh, and you guys uh, um, just make it even better. And we see that, I think, uh, really demonstrated in this event today. Similarly, uh, the other half of me is part of this great laboratory, Slack, um, where some of these ideas got started. Uh, and here we're in the midst of testing it. It's like, you know, how much better could it be? Uh, that's great. Uh, let me just say Slack Communications was a tremendous help. The security guys did really do a good job. It was okay for you guys. Many other people had to be turned away into going fill out rooms or uh, had to even leave. Um, that's a pity, but they did a great job and every, everything as far as I know went safe. I want to thank our managing uh, director, Siba Madavi, who always comes through for us. Um, Harry Kaipak, um, uh, similarly, uh, you know, a superstar admin, Martha Siegel, uh, who's busily out there and helping us, you know, getting uh, some of the G set up, and, oh, and she says, yes, yes, we can do that all the time. I love her for that. Uh, Farnas Kadem uh, helped us, and Andy Freeberg, you know, with getting the website and the streaming all organized. Um, you know, we literally started on Sunday night uh, organizing this event, so it's, it's a tremendous team that puts this together. I want to thank uh, Ken Zhu uh, for all the uh, help here, all our audiovisual team. Uh, it went uh, through without a glitch uh, this time. Um, and then we've got, uh, I want to thank briefly Eva, who was a fantastic sounding board over the last few days of just sort of figuring out what to do. Uh, and, you know, I think worked out great for us. I also want to thank uh, Peter Michelson and Lance Dixon, so the department chairs that support us uh, here. Dave McFarlane, the PPA director, uh, who has been extremely supportive of our institute. And also, particularly the director of Slack, Teach and Cow, uh, for you know spending the whole time here, um, and didn't flinch when I told him about that. There's a fraction of the cost that he might to anyhow. Yeah, <laughs> it was very good. He might not remember, but so I'll try that again next week. Um, I also want to thank the Copley Foundation, uh, without who we wouldn't have our name. But there's a lot more than that. It's actually their endowment that you know um, in, enables us to do great things to hire people like Ryan Kiesler as a Copley Fellow to bring in students to give graduate fellowships to support and give seed funds to uh, experiments uh, like BICEP2 and, and a number of others. And it's sort of what makes that whole uh, place and sort of turn it into an institute uh, possible. And then I want to give a very quick round of applause for all our fantastic speakers, uh, also for uh, just great talks. Thank you. <clears throat> but just to do just to do one more round, um, I think the entire thing, and you know, it takes many people to all work together to make this fantastic. Um, but this week for us is really to celebrate the Bicep Two team. Um, you know, it's a wonderful thing that you guys did for us, and we're just so happy to share it with you um, and sort of see our. Uh, I mean, I'm just so happy for you you finally can talk about it. I mean, I just don't know how you did it. You know, how you do this for months is just beyond me. Uh, but uh, thank you so very much. Sorry. Yeah, and, and I would like also to, to thank... Uh, One moment. Hi. To thank Chaolin and the TV 
crew from Stanford who came to make this movie because I never thought that you can take, well, two minutes of intense talk, actually 15 minutes intense talk, cut them totally, leaving the only R2 or whatever, and everybody right now asks what R2 means, is this robot, <laughs> okay? So this was a lot of fun, apparently there were more than two million hits, and suddenly Stanford is a great place to be.